All right, so we are going to bring onto the stage um, Francis D'Souza from Illumina. Um, he's going to join us right now, and uh, we get to talk about science before lunch, so lucky us. Hey, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to start with a quick show of hands from the audience. Um, how many people here today have ever sent in a sample of their DNA to a company like 23andMe or Ancestry or maybe even done the whole genome sequence? So that's, what do you think, like 50% of the yeah. audience? Um, that's, a, that's a huge number. If we'd be having this conversation, say, a decade ago, how many people do you think would have raised their hands? You know, a decade ago, uh, 23andMe had just launched. So we had just seen the beginning of consumer genomics as an industry. I think we'd be lucky if there was one person in this audience that had done that test. Uh, and we've gone from there to now 12 million people around the world have done that test. And how much would it have cost at that point um, versus what we're looking at now, say, for the whole DNA, um, whole genome sequence? You know, the 23andMe test started in the several hundred dollars, uh, and it's gone down now, I think, for the ancestry part of it. I saw a promotion yesterday where you can get it for under $50. In that same time frame, the cost for doing the whole genome, as you said, all three billion pairs, went from about a million dollars in the 2006-2007 time frame to about $1,000 today. And I announced last year that we're on a path to lower it to $100. That's, yeah, I mean, I've heard that referred to you as making Moore's law seem positively sedate, um, that, that pace of progress. And you, um, you Francis, you are the CEO of a, of a company that basically makes the machines that turn your biological sample, um, in many cases spit or saliva, into a code which a computer can read. So you, and you do that for the vast majority of the industry, whether it's a 23andMe or a, or a council or Keller test, you're doing all of it. Um, so why haven't most of us here heard of uh, Illumina? You know, it's funny, because when I got the call to join Illumina about, and I've been here about closing in on five years now, uh, frankly, I had never heard of Illumina. So Illumina is a 20-year-old company. Uh, as you said, we make the machines that do genetic sequencing. So, you know, we will sell you the machine, the hardware, the software, and we sell it into hospitals, into cancer centers, into consumer companies like 23andMe and Ancestry. Uh, this year we'll do just around $3 billion in revenue, about $40 billion in market cap. Uh, but frankly, most people haven't heard of us. Uh, we do almost no marketing, and we really are focused on our target customers. So it is the hospitals, it is the researchers, uh, and it is the direct-to-consumer companies. Um, and we don't do any business direct-to-consumer, so we are not really spending anything on marketing. And you yourself um, told me backstage that you've had your genome sequence three times. Um, you're the former CEO of Illumina has also, I think he was one of the first people in the world to do it at a cost of, of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Steve Jobs, another famous example. Um, it cost him in the tens of millions of, of dollars to have it done. Um, so do you think this is gonna stay in the realm of you know, the, the 1%, um, you know, the, the sort of wealthiest executives? Um, or do you see it being something that all of us um, would want? And why? Yeah, so I think you know, we are very much at an inflection point in the genomics industry as a whole. So the industry really kicked off in 2003 when the Human Genome Project published the first human genome, just a huge, huge event for mankind where we finally got access to our genome. That genome cost $3 billion and took 15 years to do. And the work from then till, frankly, the last couple of years has been primarily in the research arena. So there were lots and lots of researchers that were doing this amazing work to try and understand how the human genome translated into health, how your body works, and equally importantly, how it translated into disease states. Because the reality is, almost every disease, whether it's cancer, which is a disease of the genome, or diabetes, or heart disease, or, 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 or even infectious disease, ultimately stem from your genome, your predisposition to a disease, why you get it where other people don't, how you recover from that disease. And so for the last you know, decade plus, there's been lots of research going on. And we're now at the stage where that research is translating into clinical utility, where we're actually seeing patients benefiting from it. So in the last few years, for example, non-invasive prenatal testing has emerged as the fastest clinical test adopted in U.S. history, where what they've done is they've replaced amniocentesis, where you take that 
five and a half inch needle yep. and poke it into the belly of a pregnant lady. Very risky. Yeah, in 1% of cases, it causes a miscarriage. Uh, but what we've been able to do is replace that test with just a blood test on the mom, and it's actually a higher resolution test, and so that's been adopted uh, you know, as, as a genomic test. But now we're seeing clinical applications of genomics in treating cancer, in infectious disease, in dealing with genetic conditions for children. So I think we're at this, we're at this inflection point now where genomics is entering the clinic and, and will impact, you know, I think people's lives more broadly. And you've mentioned, you know, some of the more positive uses of DNA sequencing and genomics in general. Um, but, you know, you are also on your platform, and I think of you guys as kind of like the um, intel of, uh, of this equivalent intel for your industry, because you support a lot of the applications, almost like a, a chip layer. Yeah. Um, so how do you kind of pick and choose, and do you support the, the businesses that would aim to do things that are very controversial, like designer babies or, um, you know, the, the sort of range of tests out there that are making sort of junk science claims about DNA that we just do not have the evidence to support. You know, I'll start with a story on designer babies. There was a, actually it was, uh, what's the phrase for it? There's a wealthy industrialist mogul out of Silicon Valley that was curious about designer babies uh, for, for him and his partner. And, you know, the reality is we're pretty far away from the science of being able to predict you know, intelligence and, and so on. But I actually talked to one of the IVF doctors. Do you want doctors. like a baby that was like the brain of Einstein yes. and, and the, Michael Jordan? The body of Michael Jordan. Yep. Yes, <laughs> it's the brain of Einstein and the body of Michael Jordan. And so I know we can't do it, but I actually spoke to one of the IVF clinics that, that buys our stuff. And I said, you know, do you get this question a lot? And he said, yeah, we do actually. And I said, so what do you, what do, you do? And he's like, well, here's what I tell parents. I say, look, we can choose one of the embryos that you fertilize. But in the end, these are your babies. What you want to give, you ain't got to give. None of these babies has the brain of Einstein and the bi body of Michael Jordan. So <laughs> I'm working with you still as parents. Um, and that's sort of the reality of where we are now. But you bring up an important point. Genomics is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, the reason I joined Illumina from Tech five years ago is, in, in my opinion, I believe it's the most profound thing that I've ever seen in my life. And the applications you know, range from cancer treatment to infectious disease to forensics to organ transplant to data storage. Uh, but with that much power, there are lots of questions that we will have to address about what it means to be human. Uh, and there are lots of ethical questions around, you know, do we want to support designer babies? And, and I don't think we do. Uh, do we want to make, how do we make sure genomics doesn't become a test for the 1%? Um, what does it mean to be human? If we have a chance to edit out from the human genome, you know, certain conditions, which one should we? Should we edit out Down syndrome? And so we've created, we created many years ago, an ethics advisory board where we spend a lot of time thinking about those questions and, and what our position should and be. And you've also been more active recently in D.C. talking to regulators about this space. Um, yeah. One of the things that we've been chatting about is this issue of data privacy. Um, Facebook, for instance, here yesterday, I mean, we all consent, I, I would hope, to use a service like Facebook, and we have some idea about what we're giving up um, to get access to a social network like that. But I think the case of the, the recent case of the Golden State Killer, um, which you all may have followed, showed that with DNA, if I'm uploading my entire genome to a public website, I might also be implicating family members and distant relatives, and they didn't give their consent for me to do that. So how do you, how do you think about issues like that? Yeah, um, you know, there are ways that uh, genomic data is similar to other data, and there are ways that it's not. Uh, the ways that it's not, and you touched on one of them, uh, genomic data is different from other health data, other data, because one, it's not just about you. When you know something about your genome, the truth is you know something about your relatives' genomes too. And that brings questions about what's your responsibility to tell them if you know something. It also means can you put your data in a public domain because it's not just you. So your genomic data is not just your own, you share it with your family tree. Another way it's different is it's actually predictive. And so, you know, it's different from other elements of, of data, and, and so it raises questions around, well, who should have access to that? Can you be discriminated for it from health insurance or life insurance? Now, in the case And the of, answer is you can, even in the U.S. You can for life insurance in the U.S., Long -term not for health care, insurance. Long-term care, disability, yeah. yep. And so there's a, the GINA, the Non-Discrimination Act, prevents you from being discriminated just for health insurance. Uh, the state of the Golden, the, the, the case of the Golden State Killer is an interesting one. For those of you that don't know, this is the case of a serial killer who uh, raped over 50 women between 1976 and 86 and, and killed over a dozen. Uh, and the case went dead after 86. Uh, but recently, in the last few months, law enforcement uh, actually 
sequenced data, uh, DNA they had from an old sample of, uh, from the crime scene, uploaded it to a public site, uh, GED Match out of Florida, and actually were able to find relative connections of his. And then they looked at that family tree and estimated they were looking for a male, they were looking for a person about this age, and they were able to narrow it down and catch that person. And so that raised lots of questions around, well, is that an acceptable use? I think for most of us, you know, we would consent perhaps to give up our DNA if it meant finding a relative of ours that had raped and murdered 50 people. But what if it's a relative that just smuggled pot across the border? Um. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> and so we got relative. lots of questions, right? So we at Illumina, for example, you know, uh, in the vast majority of cases, customers keep their own data on-prem. We do have a cloud offering that we will store their data, but it's their data. We don't mine it. We don't do drug discovery on it. And do you get requests from law enforcement to access this data? We, we would not cooperate with law enforcement except in the case of a specific subpoena. But the reality is we actually don't have any identif identifiable data. We have genomic data but we couldn't tell you whose it was or, or anything like that. And so we're not a great target for law enforcement. But uh, then the question was, what about customers of yours like Ancestry, 23andMe? Is that where law enforcement got the, this data? And both of those won't cooperate with law enforcement in general, except, again, in the case of a very specific subpoena. So they, didn't, they weren't the ones who cooperated with law enforcement for this case. In this case, it was an open source, you know, public database that people had uploaded their own genome to that anybody has access to. Yep. So the first time we met, I think you had just joined Illumin. It was a, it was a few years ago, and you know, you were still learning about the space, having come from Symantec and been, you know, in tech basically your entire career. And I think you're an example of this general convergence of technology and, and healthcare, Silicon Valley getting into bio. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think that it's, it's a good thing overall? Um, or do you think, you know, we're, if we end up with a lot of kind of less educated healthcare investors and executives, are we going to end up in a, in a situation where we encounter the next Theranos? You know, uh, I think genomics sits at the nexus of, you know, sort of biology um, and you know, tech, in the sense that what we do at Illumina is we digitize biology. So we take in a biological sample, you know, blood, saliva, and we output your code, you know. So everything that happens after we output the code requires software, right? So to interpret the code, to understand what variants exist in your genomic code, how does that translate into disease and health, all of that requires an enormous amount of software, a lot, a lot of algorithm development, a lot of big data, a lot of AI. And so there is a huge need. All the buzzwords. <laughs> yeah, all the buzzwords, right? Um, and so there's a huge need for more people from tech to get into uh, certainly genomics, but I'd argue more broadly uh, biology. And you've been, you've been kind of bringing them into Illumina. You have a, a board member who um, is an Apple executive, Phil yeah. Schiller, and um, you yourself sit on the board of, of Disney. Um, so, you know, do you, are you encouraging all these folks to get their DNA sequenced? <laughs> uh, I am, and, and honestly, I think this is where it would be great if more people had heard of Illumina, because um, most conversations start the way the conversation with me started, which is, hey, I'd like to talk to you about Illumina. What's that? And then I have to say, well, you've heard of 23andMe, right? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, we're the machines they use. Um, and so I think it would be helpful for us to, to talk more about it. We have Phil on our board. We have uh, John Thompson, who's the chairman of Microsoft, who's on our board. Um, and so we definitely are bringing sort of the, you know, the worlds together. Um, so you, like Google, um, you have, Illumina actually has its own set of moonshots. Um, and uh, these are some projects that have been spun out from the company that you see is very ambitious and may or may not work. Um, one that we should definitely talk about is a company called Grail, um, which is trying to develop a, a blood test for early stage cancer, um, which just, you know, is something that seems so sci-fi to me. Um, do you think that this is in the in the realm of possibility, given where we are with the science and, and technology today? I think it is. I think it may be one of the most ambitious things we've ever launched out of Illumina. Uh, so we do spin out a lot of companies. Uh, you know, we're very close to the genomic space, and so we tend to see things, you know, before I think the, a lot of times the rest of the industry does. So we spin out Grail, Helix. We spun out a forensics company, an organ transplant company. Uh, the idea behind Grail came, and I remember it very well, uh, you know, we have a business for non-invasive prenatal testing where we do a blood test from moms and gauge the health of the baby. And in 10 cases, our lab came back and said, look, the baby's fine, but we're seeing something in the blood that's odd. Cancer. So we reported back to the gynecologist saying, look, the baby's fine, but there's something wrong here. 
And the doctor said, no, mom's healthy. And so we kept track of those 10 moms. And in each of those cases, the, the mom had cancer. And so when we were, I remember we were in the boardroom, we were reviewing the results. And as we walked out, I was talking to Jay, and Jay's like, look, this is, this is big. I mean, and how do you communicate that? I mean, this is, a, this is a person who did this test thinking that they were going to find something out about their unborn child, and then you're learning that they actually have cancer and may yeah. not know about it. Yeah, and I know in one of the cases, the woman had uh, advanced colorectal cancer. And the thing is, that has no symptoms, right? And the difference between catching it in stage one versus stage four, it's a 90 plus percent survival rate versus a less than 10 percent survival rate. And so it is huge for things like that and pancreatic and ovarian and a lot of these cancers have really no symptoms, right? And so, and you're, But you're finding that the, the tumors themselves have shed. DNA that, that gets shed around the blood and you were able to, to pick right. it up. So what we, we figured was that what we were seeing was exactly that, cancer DNA in the blood. And so that was the idea and we launched Grail in January 2016 and we spun it out. And this company has raised how much money? I mean, it's, it's it just it's announced a couple of days ago and another raise. So it's raised 1.6 billion in the last two years. From Gate, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, yeah. So some real top of art of, of tech. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge idea because uh, if you can do it, it's life changing. It's life changing, and can you imagine a world where we're all getting a blood test once a year, and it tells us if we have early stage cancer or not? And you know, they announced some results a couple of weeks ago at AACR. Um, and one of the big questions was, will you get too many false positives? Because we all know the false positive problem with mammograms and, and PSAs. And the results were astonishing. The, the results that they presented at AACR, you know, they did a, a sample size of 580 people that didn't have cancer. Uh, they ran the test on it, and they called all 580 correct except for five, where they said, we think they have cancer. Two of them have subsequently found that they have cancer, and they just didn't know. Uh, and we're tracking the remaining three. So you could have a test that has greater than 99% specificity. Uh, and then they were able to show that for a lot of these hard to find cancers, you know, they were able to, in stage one till three, they had a 65% detection rate, and stage four, 95%. So early results, but really promising. So Grail has um, started out as very much a Silicon Valley operation and, and now finds itself um, in Asia. Um, and there's some talk of a, of a Hong Kong IPO. Is that gonna happen, by the way? So the way they got into Asia was they bought a company that uh, Dennis Lo out of the Chinese University yeah. in Hong Kong did. And Dennis is one of the, the geniuses in the space. We actually bought a previous company from Dennis Lo, uh, Veronada, in the non-invasive prenatal. Natal. So he's one of the giants in you know, circulating DNA. Um, I don't know what their IPO plans are, but Dennis is amazing. And, and they actually got a test for uh, nasopharyngeal cancer, which they announced a couple of days ago that they will be launching later this year in And South you Asia. see very high rates of that particular kind of cancer in Asia, in Asia. Um, because exactly. of smoking. Yeah. Um, so you know, that brings me to a bigger question, which is countries like China, people are talking about you know, China especially as being a hub for biotech. Um, and there is just amazing progress and innovation there, but there's also much fewer regulations. And you know, people are definitely talking a lot more about things like designer babies, um, which we already touched upon. Is that a, is that a concern for you um, as a you know company CEO that is is supporting a lot of kind of these applications and a lot of the science? Yeah, you know, we we have this saying in our company that there's no such thing as a short China conversation. Um, in fact, five years ago, there was an active, when I joined, there was an active debate on the board about should we go into China at all? And the board was pretty split. Now, I'm a big believer that we have to. And in fact, we went into China, and it's, in the last five years, it's now emerged as our second biggest country market. They spend a lot on R&D. Uh, they are concerned that they're going to be hit by the biggest wave of cancer to ever hit humanity because of the size of that population, because of pollution, because they're dealing with obesity rates going up. Um, and so it's a complex market, but it's emerging as a, a, a really big genomics market. Uh, we are working with the Chinese FDA on the regulatory environment there, but they do allow some things there uh, that they don't allow here in the US, for example. So on the regulatory front, um, where do you see your company taking a stand and pushing forward legislation? And what are some of the issues that matter to you? And are they the same set of issues that we might see a Facebook and a Google um, standing up about? Um, whether it's immigration um, or any of the other things that we've talked about at, at Code. Yeah, there are some areas where there's definitely an overlap. Uh, we believe uh, in the importance of being able to attract the best talent. Uh, even if you look at our executive team, you know, I am an immigrant. Uh, it's important for something 
when you're tackling problems this big, you need access to the world's best people. And so we definitely believe in that. We believe in STEM education in every community we're in, uh, in the US, but we believe it in the UK and China. Um, but then there are some areas that are very specific to us. For example, uh, you know, we like the direction the FDA is going in now. We think the FDA is an essential player in the genomics ecosystem. But the old way of regulating diagnostics doesn't work for genomics, where you are learning new things all the time and you need to update tests. And that, there's no good framework for that with the FDA, and so they're working on it now. Um, we're also working on the Hill. I talked about, you know, we want uh, certain bills to pass. There's a bill, uh, H.R. 5062, that got introduced into Congress a few months ago, which would allow uh, Medicare to actually reimburse states to provide access for whole genome testing, you know, to babies. And, you know, that's been introduced into Congress uh, under... Uh, so what you're saying is, you know, we could see the next generation of kids being born in a immediately having their, their uh, genome sequence, and yeah, that would be paid for. And not even, we believe deeply that if you have a baby in the NICU, and it's been in the NICU for five days, and you still can't diagnose what's wrong, we think the kid should have their whole genome. And the reason for that, and I'll tell you just some stats and then two very quick anecdotes. The stats are, if a child has an undiagnosed genetic disease, they go on average in a five to seven year diagnostic odyssey. In those five to seven years, they'll be misdiagnosed on average three times. In 59% of the cases, the families will deplete all their savings. In 9% of the cases, the families declare bankruptcy. The alternative is you could do the test, and in up to 50% of the cases, you get, a you get a diagnosis right away. So you could get a diagnosis in day six of a child's life or when they're eight years old, right? And that's as stark as a difference. And I'll tell you two quick stories that we just dealt with. One is of a child in, in San Francisco. It's a child uh, was fine until three years old and then suddenly started presenting with total system shutdown. They had kidney, she had kidney failure, heart failure, muscle failure, which is pretty common for genetic diseases. You go along fine and then you hit the wall. Went to UCSF, you know, they were trying to figure out what was wrong. They couldn't figure it out. They had a theory it might be a mitochondrial problem, which for those of you, you know, that remember high school biology, it's the powerhouse of the cell, and the truth is if it's a mitochondrial problem, you can't do anything, because if you do anything, you could cause the kid to collapse completely and die. So they told the parents to, to go home uh, for hospice care. There was nothing they could do, the child would die. But the people at UCSF knew our team at Illumina, and they called us and said, look, can you help us? This doesn't fit, something's wrong here. And so we did a whole genome sequence of the baby and the parents, and what we found was that it, it wasn't a mitochondrial problem, it was a kidney malfunction. There was a genetic mutation that caused a kidney malfunction. They managed the baby's fluids, I stabilized the baby, the kid's gonna get a kidney transplant and lead a normal life. Another situation was uh, another kid, Ellis, who normal until 16 months, then also started to have sort of a, a system shut down. Mom went to the doctor, doctor said, not sure. She went back again. Uh, at 19 months, said, look, this baby's really not hitting any of the development milestones. Doctor misdiagnosed the baby. Uh, they gave her some treatment, but the baby didn't react. And then the mom at 28 months old of the child saw a child on the Today Show that looked a lot like her child. Went back and said, I need a genomic test on the baby. So they did a genomic test, and they found that the baby had a riboflavin disorder, a transporter disorder. All the baby needed was vitamin B2, like 50 cents a day, a supplement, and the kid would be normal. The problem was they didn't diagnose it at month 16. So now the baby can't walk. The baby's in a wheelchair. The baby can't use arms or hands at all. The baby can't swallow. It's fed through a G-tube, right? So if that child, when it had been first presented at 16 months, had got a genomic test, the baby would have a normal life today. And that's the urgency. That's why we need help supporting this bill. Um, I think we have time for a quick question, if anyone wants to come up. All right. So there's a question over there. I have a fascinating discussion. I'm Jim Breyer with Breyer Capital. Uh, there are major advances also currently in computational pathology, uh, machine learning, AI in medicine. How might you work uh, with some of those research efforts to bring a mo more holistic view of cancer or other uh, disease as we look forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, we are looking to actively engage with that community. Uh, we have a, a, a set of companies uh, around each of those areas that we're working with and by disease state. So, for example, Tempest in oncology. Uh, but we have two companies in our incubator that are, you know, focused on bringing big data, one for 
treating post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, genetically and, and with big data, another one with fertility. Um, and so I'd love to, to the extent that you have companies, we'd love to engage. There's a lot of ground to cover. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Another question? I just wanted uh, your opinions on what's going on with CRISPR and how that plays in with the things that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Should we give a quick, yes. give a quick so, explanation uh, of CRISPR? CRISPR is a technology that's emerged that allows you to uh, edit a genome, to change the genomic code. So we do reading. CRISPR is one of the sets of tools that allows you to do writing. It is enormously exciting. Like a pair of scissors. It's a pair of scissors, and you can insert something new. You can adjust the genome. And, you know, that means that, you know, you can do lots and lots of things. You can cure certain conditions. So, for example, there are some conditions like cystic fibrosis that are caused by a single mutation in your genome. You can go and change that, potentially, and cure cystic fibrosis. Um, and so it's hugely exciting, the potential for CRISPR. Um, and so, you know, we're super supportive about that industry. We obviously go hand in hand. Every time you write, you want to read to make sure that is what you wrote. Um, and the, the potential for, I think, what CRISPR could do is enormous. All right. I think we are just about out of questions and probably should let you all go to lunch. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thank you. Fascinating as always.